Good morning. I tell you, this group has some energy this morning. Any group that is going to boo Emma McDowell with some questions she asks definitely has some energy. I don't know if I should be really excited or really terrified about that, but, but man, you guys came ready this morning. As Emma said, um, my family and I have called Faith Community Church our home for over 25 years, which is pretty hard to believe, but yeah, I, I guess that's a glad I don't know. Um, but you know, the last several years, we have been worshiping at the Framingham campus. So it's always a treat to be able to come back to see some faces that I haven't seen for a while and to see a bunch of new faces. That's just as exciting as well. So now, as Emma also mentioned, or I don't know if she mentioned it or not, but I'll mention, right, we're in the week two of a new series. It's a series called, um, Does It Really Say That? And what we do is we look at some common phrases that may sound like they come out of the Bible, but we dig into them a little bit. And we're just coming off our summer movie series. And so what I thought I might do to start things off is to do something a little fun that kind of bridges between the summer movie series and the Does It Really Say That series. And, and what we're going to do is we're going to play a little game, all right, which is like when you have a substitute, and I'm kind of like a substitute, when you have a substitute at school, all right, either you get a pop quiz or you play a game. That was always what happened to me. So I was thinking about the pop quiz thing, but I said, no, we'll do the game piece. So it's a really simple game. It's a simple game. I call it A or B. All right? Now, in this case, the A stands for Avengers, okay? And the B stands for Bible. And what's, what's going to happen is this. I'm going to show a quote on the screen, all right? And then I'm going to ask you to yell out, A, if you think that quote is from an Avengers movie, and I'm going to ask you to yell out, B, if you think the quote is from the Bible. That's all there is to it. Really simple. You're going to say A, or you're going to say B. Is it from the Avengers or from the And we're going to start off with a really easy one. We'll start off with a really easy one to get things started. So here's the first one. Is this your king? No, no, wait, 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 wait. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to say, if you think Avengers, then yell, then yell out A. And then I'm going to say, okay, now if you think it's the Bible, yell out B, okay? And I heard before, you guys are ready to yell a bunch. So here we go. If you think that's from the Avengers, say A. A. Okay? If you think it's from the Bible, say B. B. Right, because you, you can see Pontius Pilate with Jesus saying, is this your king? You can see him saying that, right? Yeah, he didn't say that. Actually, Eric Killmonger from Black Panther said that. But you know, that was a really good try. That was a really good try. I'd still give you a gold star for participation, but we're going to go on to number two. We got a few more. All right. For it is God's servant, an avenger, that brings wrath on the one who does wrong. If you think it's avenger, say A. a. If you think it's the Bible, say B. Yeah, you guys did pretty good. All right, all right, that's from Romans 13, 4. You know, I thought maybe sticking the word avenger in there, but that was a little too obvious, wasn't it? A little too obvious. All right, number three. Challenge incites conflict. Conflict breeds catastrophe. Okay, now, no getting out the, Bi the Bible app and going real fast here on this. All right, let's stay pure to the, to the, you ready? So if you think it's an avenger, say A. a. And if you think it's the Bible, say B. Kind of pretty split there. That actually is from, from Captain America. I don't know, that sounded very Proverbs-ish to me. But I don't, I, that, but that, you, very good. All right, next one. In times of crisis, the wise build bridges while the foolish build barriers. The wise build bridges while the foolish build barriers. Okay, if you think it's the Avengers, say A. a. If you think it's the Bible, say B. B. Yeah, definitely sounds very Proverbs-ish, but no, 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 no. <laughs> Black Panther, Black Panther said that. Who knew, who knew? All right. Whoever listens to me will live securely and be undisturbed by the dread of danger. All right now you're like, oh, I'm trying to get inside Kurt's head, I don't know. All right, if you think it's the Avengers, say A. All right, and if you think it's the Bible, say B. Yeah, we're, we're pretty split on that one. That's Proverbs, that's Proverbs. All right, final one, final one. Work together to be an example of how we should treat one another. Okay, work together 
Okay, you think it's the Avengers? A. Not many Avengers. You think it's the Bible? B. 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 Yeah, no, that's Black Panther 2. <laughs> that was Black Panther 2. Can you believe it? It's, it's kind of amazing. I was kind of shocked. And I, had, I, was, I found a whole bunch of them. We could kind of keep going and going. I was pretty surprised. And that's actually probably a pretty good one for us to transition to. So how many, did anybody, honestly now, anybody get them all? How many of you voted for both of them every time? Okay. That's kind of what I probably would have done myself. Okay. So um, that'll transition us into our new series, right? Moving from the movies to, uh, to does it really say that? And we're in, uh, and we're in week two. And we're going to look at a phrase that if you're a parent of kids, it might be one that you've used a fair amount uh, in your days. And that is the one, cleanliness is next to godliness. Cleanliness is next to godliness. Now, is it from the Bible? And let me answer this in two ways. All right, so first, if you're kind of like high school and below, because here's how I would answer this. Is this from the Bible? Absolutely if we look in, I think it's, I think it's Hezekiah chapter 4, says that, that the Lord is pleased by a clean home and, and a clean body, right? And um, uh, as he is also with a daily bath or shower, right? Thou, thou shalt use the clothes hamper and don't let me ever find another pair of socks under the bed. Okay, so I might have I embellished on that a little bit. But I, th- I, think, I think you all, again, you high schoolers below, understand what the application point for today is going to be. Now, for you, the older crowd, is this uh, from the Bible? Let me answer it this way. Uh, no. <laughs> it's not. It's not from the Bible. I was, I was, uh, I was just preaching, <laughs> you know. Uh, and by the way, if you're still scrolling through your Bible app, there's not a book of Hezekiah in the Bible. That's, that's the standard one we always throw out if you want to kind of fool somebody. Um, so it's not, right? right? You've, how many of you have been fooled by Hezekiah before? I think I have. All right. Um, but So it's not in the Bible, but can we still learn something from it? Let's, let's see what we can do. And what we're going to do, we're going to look at three things this morning, all right? We're going to look first at its authorship, all right? So where did it come from? If it's not from the Bible, where did that phrase, cleanliness is next to godliness, come from? The second thing we'll look at is its authority, right? Should we pay attention to it? It may still contain some biblical truth. Should we pay attention to it? And then the third thing is application. What should we do about it? Okay? What should we do about it? So the first thing we're going to do is we'll look at authorship, so where did this thing come from? Well, the first kind of recorded expression of something similar to this comes from Sir Francis Bacon, way back in 1605. So Francis Bacon was a kind of a well-known scientist and philosopher and probably best, well, probably best known for inventing the BLT sandwich. And that's... Right, Sir Francis Bacon, bacon, lettuce, and tomato. My, w- my wife said if I was going to say that, I better stop and pause and raise a joke flag just in case, because that's kind of how my humor tends to go. All right, he didn't invent the BLT sandwich. But, um, but here is what he said. Here's what he said. Cleanness of body was ever esteemed to proceed from a due reverence to God, to society, and to ourselves. Pretty good. The kind of thing you'd expect someone that wears a hat and has a collar like that to say. And, uh, and so that's the first time we've, we've, we hear something like that, at least in Western thought. The first person to ever use the actual phrase, cleanliness is next to godliness, was this guy who's John Wesley. So John Wesley was a, a, a kind of a, f- a famous preacher that many of you may have heard of. He lived in England all during the 18th century, most during most of the 18th century. And he traveled throughout Great Britain and Ireland speaking to big outdoor gatherings. He was kind of like the Billy Graham of his day. And um, he also started a movement within the Church of England called Methodism, which evolved into the Methodist Church that many of you are familiar with today. And shortly before he died, in 1791, 
he wrote a sermon called On Dress. And this is what he said. He said, let it be observed that slovenliness is no part of religion, that neither this nor any text of scripture condemns neatness of apparel. Certainly, this is a duty, not a sin. Cleanliness is indeed next to godliness. And so that's where the phrase comes from. It typically is attributed to John Wesley, and it's also given us an important lesson that we've learned this morning, which is that we should always expect the Methodist churches to be the cleanest ones that we go into. Just saying, never really tested that out, but that's one thing that I get from this. All right, so that's where it came from, with a little fun. Came from John Wesley way back in 1791. So it's clearly, it didn't come from the Bible. But is there some Bible truth that we might learn from it? Well, let's look into it a little more. And so we'll dig into its authority. So is cleanliness next to godliness? Well, I think it actually was the comedian Gallagher who answered this question best. Here's what Gallagher said. Cleanliness isn't next to godliness. Goggles is. I looked it up. <laughs> and if you're in a dictionary, that's, that's pretty accurate. Right. Does anybody know what Gallagher was the most famous for? He's this, a lot of you younger folks may never heard of Gallagher. Watermelons. watermelons. That's right. So if you've never heard of Gallagher and you want to learn about Gallagher, what you Google is watermelon smasher. You'll find out a little bit about Gallagher. But anyway, I'm on a tangent now. But in all seriousness... Personal hygiene and spiritual purity are actually very intricately linked in the Old Testament. For the Hebrew people, cleanliness wasn't next to godliness. It was absolutely part of godliness. The standards that God established concerning cleanliness for the Israelites touched on every aspect of their life. Unlike all the other nations, God gave his people specific instructions about cleanliness. He showed them how to maintain purity and what to do to regain it if they lost it. For example, here in the book of Leviticus, these are some instructions for how to be cleansed after having been healed from a disease. It says the person to be cleansed must wash their clothes, shave off all their hair, and bathe with water then they will be ceremonially clean. A little bit later in Leviticus, there's a, uh, uh, another set of instructions about regarding diet and purification. It says anyone who eats anything found dead or torn by wild animals must wash their clothes and bathe with water. But if they do not wash their clothes and bathe themselves, they will be held responsible. Not sure for what, but it sounds pretty ominous to me. <laughs> and then in Exodus, if we go a little earlier in the Bible, there is some instruction about cleanliness and worship. Then the Lord said to Moses, make a bronze basin for washing. Aaron and his sons are to wash their hands and feet with water from it. Whenever they enter the tent of meeting, they shall wash with water so that they will not die. So, while the words cleanliness is next to godliness might not appear in the Old Testament, the concept certainly does. But those are pretty harsh laws that we're reading. And what do we do with that? Well, I think one application um, from Leviticus that we read might be that we could require people to shave their heads before coming to church if they've gotten over COVID. Of course, I have a feeling we'd have quite a number of bald people around, including myself, but that's also probably missing the point. You see, the religious leaders of Jesus' time were hyper-focused on making sure that the people followed the laws. Not just the laws about cleanliness, but all of the other laws too. Laws about diet, 
and dress and agriculture and worship. By one count, there are 613 laws in the Old Testament. And to make sure that people wouldn't even come close to breaking any of them, the religious leaders added more rules on top of those in the Old Testament for people to follow. But when Jesus arrived on the scene, he made it clear to the religious leaders that their focus was all wrong. He made it clear that following the laws is not what brings us close to God. Instead, it's the attitude of our hearts that brings us closer to God. He made it clear that the focus should not be on what we do or how things might look on the outside. Instead, our focus should be on what's happening on the inside. In the book of Matthew, Jesus makes it very clear when he calls out the religious leaders on, for focusing on the external. He says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. And he goes on, in the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. So what do we do with this? Do we just say, okay, cleanliness is not next to godliness, so let's throw away our deodorant and plan for a big church food fight, you know, do it in love. Well, that's probably missing the point too, although maybe we'll, we'll find out in a couple of weeks when we have that big gathering. But let's spend some time with application. Let's talk about what we can learn from a saying like cleanliness is next to godliness. Now, if you do come away from this morning's talk with a renewed commitment to shower regularly and keep your room clean, then far be it for me to say no to that. But what I want to leave you with this morning is actually a bit of a warning. A call for us to check ourselves. And I'm including myself in that. When John Wesley preached that sermon about cleanliness back in the 18th century, being next to godliness, cleanliness was a big deal then. Cleanliness tied directly to the quality of life. And it could even be the difference between life and death. He was using it as a call to action for people of that day. And definitely, a focus on cleanliness is good advice for healthy living. But I would suggest that it should not be tied to godliness. And you may be thinking, I am certainly not going to make that same mistake. We live in a different time. And that's probably true. In fact, I doubt any of you have ever seriously tried to link cleanliness with godliness. But what we can tend to do today is slip into replacing the word cleanliness with other words. What do I mean? And this is, this is where the talk will get a little serious. Let me give you some examples of what people might say today even though they might not say it out loud or might not even realize what it is they're projecting. They may come across with a view like this. Being a Republican is next to godliness or being a Democrat is next to godliness. Does that make you squirm a little to think about that? Yeah. How about this one? Being for gun rights is next to godliness. Or being for gun control is next to godliness. How about this one? Being pro-life is next to godliness, or being pro-choice is next to godliness. Making you feel uncomfortable? 
I'm not saying what's right or wrong. I'm saying it's easy to portray that in how we interact with people. In fact, that's my first point, application point. We have to be very careful to not tie our view on social or political issues with what someone must also believe in order to be considered a Christian. Because I have what might be some bad news for some people. There are going to be both Republicans and Democrats in heaven. And there's going to be both Republicans and Democrats in hell. There are going to be people who are pro-gun rights and... Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm drunk, and pro-gun control in both heaven and in hell. And there are going to be people who are both pro-life and pro-choice in heaven and in hell. We have to be careful about what we communicate and how we communicate because when you connect your view on a topic as something fundamental to being a Christian, you are automatically alienating everyone that doesn't share your same view. Why should they seriously consider Christianity if they don't share your view, if that's what you've portrayed? If a non-Christian sees a Christian associating a political affiliation with being a Christian, they'll automatically think that if they don't share that political view, then Jesus isn't for them. Instead, I would challenge you to follow the example that Paul gives in his first letter to the Corinthians. That's my second application point. Seek to find common ground with others, even when you may not see things the same way that they do. It's how Paul tried to handle people that had different views or beliefs than he did. Here's what he said. Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. A slave to everyone? Yeah. Even members of the other political party? Yeah. Even people that don't agree with my view on this really, really, really important issue? Yeah. Even them. Even them. <laughs> Paul was surrounded by competing worldviews. Right? He had legal Pharisees on the one side. He had the Roman Empire that felt that it was divinely appointed on another side. And he had a plethora of pagan deities on a third side. And what did Paul do? He stubbornly refused to take sides with any of them. And what he wrote just a few verses later was his own personal mission statement and one that I think we can learn a lot from. He says, I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. So how do we do that? How do we do that? Following the recent Supreme Court decision about abortion, Pastor Dorian sent out some advice to the Framingham campus on how we could respond, regardless of what our personal view might be on the ruling. And I thought that what he wrote was so good that I want to share it again as my third application point. And I would summarize it this way. Love radically, listen deeply, and show hospitality. Let's look at those one at a time. The first one, love radically. Dorian shared in that note that we have a powerful opportunity to pour out love, mercy, and grace on those around us in this time when that is not what we are seeing demonstrated in the world. A recent report in Scientific American said that communication today is more polarized than we have seen in years. The report described our communication today as marked by 
three traits. The first trait is called othering. Othering. That's the idea that if people don't agree with us, we tend to label them as being so different from us that they're almost incomprehensible. In other words, if someone doesn't agree with us these days on a particular topic, today we are less likely to respond with something like, why do you feel that way? And instead go straight to, you must have two heads for thinking that. That just characterizes how communication in general is happening today. That's one trait. The second common trait of communication today is called aversion, a term we've probably heard. That's the idea that if people don't agree with us, we don't just view them as different than us, but instead we view them as actually dislikable. In other words, today, more than ever, if someone doesn't agree with us, we tend to go straight to just not liking them. And the third common trait of communication today, in general, is called moralization. That's where we begin to view people that believe differently than us as being morally bankrupt. That means that today, more than ever, if someone doesn't agree with us, we actually start to think of them as bad people. In 2019, there was a study by the Pew Research Foundation that found that 55% of Republicans say Democrats are more immoral when compared with other people. And 47% of Democrats say the same thing about Republicans. This all combines to create a sense of literal fear to engage with people that we don't agree with. Dorian reminded us in his email to the Framingham campus that we can represent Jesus by loving radically. 1 John 4.18 says, perfect love drives out fear in this time when fear characterizes how we communicate with others. Let us love so much, as, as much as we can and as well as we can, so that fear is pushed back. So that's loving radically. The second of those points was listening deeply. Listening deeply to people in our world. James 1, 19 and 20 says, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. You think you're immune to that kind of thinking? Well, I always thought I was, but I'm realizing that I can fall into all of these traps too because it is just all around us. Last year, my wife and I were on a vacation out of state and we were having breakfast at a local diner, which is something that we, that we love to do. And the server there was super friendly, and we were having a great time. Just a great time. And then, out of the blue, the server started sharing their unsolicited views on COVID vaccination. And we found ourselves suddenly looking and feeling very different towards this person than we had just a few minutes before, only because that's what they had shared that they had shared a view that was different than ours, which I'm not gonna talk about what that view was, because that's not the point. So as we reflected on that incident, we realized that we needed to check our attitudes towards other people and how we interacted with them. Right, because let's face it, at the end of the day, we're all either sinners saved by grace or sinners that need to be saved by grace. That's all we are. So that was the second thing, listening deeply. The third item, showing hospitality. Dorian's third piece of advice was for us to be a church living out a culture of welcome to all people. After talking about loving each other deeply in 1 Peter, this is what Peter says. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. 
And in Hebrews, do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Let's be hospitable to all people, making them feel welcomed regardless of their position or their opinion. So I know that this is a lot to think about. And you may not agree with everything I have to say. And maybe that's going to be your first test. Can you look at me without othering or aversion or moralization because of what I've said? Can you invite your neighbor over for a barbecue regardless of their political affiliation? Because you know, what was most important to Jesus was people and their souls. Many people in Jesus' time wanted him to save them from the occupying Romans. But instead, he told them to give Caesar what was Caesar's. And they became so angry and so disillusioned with him that they crucified him. But that wasn't his priority. People were his priority. So let me summarize. What do we take from a saying like cleanliness is next to godliness? Take a warning not to focus on the external. That's not what's important. Take a warning to not look at people just through a lens of political affiliation or social viewpoints. Instead, make people your priority, even if it might mean listening to positions or viewpoints that you don't agree with. Let your focus be to love well, so that by all possible means, we might bring others to the saving grace of Jesus. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we live in a challenging time, a time of diverse opinions, a time when it can be difficult to communicate with people who don't see the same way that we do. But Father, help us to be a light in the midst of that darkness. Help us to truly see others as you see them, as sinners saved by grace or sinners in need of being saved by grace. Help us to keep our priorities, your priorities. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Everybody have a great day and stay cool. Yeah.